you panic in your heart. I know it's okay. You'll, you'll, you'll make it because we're all friends here and we're all going to have a good time together. Um, but what we're talking about today is evangelism. And a little book that I gave Betty Grace to share with the kids, it's trying to give us some ideas. What are the ways that we can share our faith? And it doesn't just have to be, you know, like tracks on the table at the restaurant. It, it can be something that is more you. Um, about being intentional and authentic about sharing your faith. That's really what's effective. Um, that that's the place where God really calls us to do um, his work in going and making disciples is all about being ourselves open and honest about our faith. And I have these really great earrings that um, my mother-in-law gave me, and they have crosses on them. And I look at them every day when I'm choosing jewelry, and I never pick them up. I'm like, why don't you wear those earrings? Well, they're kind of big, you know, and turquoise, and they really jump out at you. It's like, yeah, I'm afraid of those earrings. <laughs> you know, what kind of conversations am I going to get into if I wear these earrings all day long? Um, and not that you just have to wear your Christianity on your sleeve or on your ears or have a big giant tattoo across your forehead. You know, I love Jesus. Um, but those things that maybe we do subliminally that kind of suppress or hide or keep our faith kind of in the, in the back seat instead of in the front seat. That that's what's the difference between, you know, just being a nice, happy Christian and wandering through your life and being intentional about sharing your evangelism. So that's kind of where we're starting with this. Our story this morning is John chapter 4. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus had come to visit Jesus in the dead of night. And we have that beautiful verse that everybody remembers. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, that, that he's the one that Jesus is telling him. He's going, man, you're supposed to be a teacher of the people and you don't even know anything. And so he has that conversation with this very, very learned man, Nicodemus, who, who knows his Bible backwards and forwards, but he does it in secret. And in chapter 4, we have this very public conversation that Jesus is about to have with a woman who doesn't know anything about the Bible or the history or, or all of those pieces. She's not been educated in the faith. But she becomes a really powerful evangelist. It says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Jesus and his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman says to Jesus, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why, how can you ask me for a drink? Because Jews did not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asking you for a drink, you would have asked me. And I would have given you living water. And she looks at him and she says, Man, you don't have a bucket. You don't have anything to get the water out. How are you going to give me water? And he tells her. <laughs> she asks him, Are you even better than Jacob who gave us the well? says, everybody who drinks this water is going to get thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman says to him, hey, that sounds pretty great. Give me that water. Then I don't have to keep coming here. Nobody's going to bother me. Because she didn't come when the time when everybody else would go to the well. She didn't want to be bothered by any of the people. She didn't want to have all the little chit-chat with the other ladies because they weren't going to be very nice to her. She went when nobody else was around in the heat of the day to schlep her water back home to take care of her family and do her chores. And Jesus says back to her, go and call your husband and come back. And she replies, well, I don't have a husband. 
And Jesus tells her, you're right when you say you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't even yours. How would you react to that conversation? She says, sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our <laughs> Let's change the subject. <laughs> Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So, so since you know everything, what, what are we really supposed to be doing? And, and where should we really be worshipping? And Jesus said, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And then she says, I know that the Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. And when he's here, he's going to explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, who speak to you, am he. And then the disciples come back, and they see Jesus talking with this woman, and they think, whoa, what the heck is going on here? But they don't say anything. They just give some interesting looks. And, and she leaves her water jar and rushes back to town. And tells the people, you got to meet this guy. He told me everything I ever did. And then while she's running back into town to tell the people in town what's going on and who this person is, she, he has this conversation with his disciples about food. It's very confusing for them. They're like, Jesus, here, have some food. He says, no, nah, I got food that you don't even know about. The harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. You need to get out there and start harvesting people. And they're kind of like, did she give him a sandwich? <laughs> what is going on? How does he have any food? We didn't have any food walking here. Who was that lady? They don't ask him any of those questions. They're just looking at each other going, I am so confused. But he's trying to help them see. He switches the conversation from this physical need of water with the woman and this physical need of food with his disciples to the spiritual reality that he's able to give. For her, it's this living water that will keep you from being thirsty all the time. You're looking for love in all the wrong places, sweetheart. And you're never going to find fulfillment and completion in those places, in the arms of those men, but you're going to find them in the arms of love, which is God. Let me give you some water that's going to change everything. For the disciples, he's saying, yeah, I'm not really that physically hungry. You're feeding your body all the time. Isn't that how we live our lives? We're always feeding our bodies when it's really our spirit and our hearts that are hungry. We just keep feeding our bodies because we can, we can numb the pain. It's an interesting phenomenon. When you eat ice cream, it, it literally like numbs your esophagus and kind of numbs your stomach, and it's very calming. That we're numbing the pain. Now, I'm not saying that so that you go never eat ice cream again. I love ice cream. We eat it almost every day. But... Yeah, don't eat it too fast. You're going to get a headache, Bernie. <laughs> but it's that reality of I, I have a pain that I can't really deal with. And so if I eat this ice cream, I'll just forget about it for a little while. We end up feeding those spiritual and emotional needs with food a lot of the time. And Jesus says, could you get your head out of your stomach and start thinking about your spirit? Let's look at what people are really hungry for. I love that on Thursdays when people come and we give them their grocery cards and their gas vouchers, we also pray with them. 
Because they may have come here for a physical need, but they hopefully will get a spiritual one met as well. That you can get a twofer in that situation. At the end of the story, after all these people come out, as many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. That it wasn't just what she knew about him that convinced them. It was meeting him themselves. When we look at being authentic and intentional and sharing our faith with somebody else, we feel crippled because we don't have all the answers. And when I meet with people, I don't always have all the answers. And the ones I do have might be wrong. You know, it's just, we can't ever know exactly who God is. We just have our own experience of what we've seen and what we've heard and how we have experienced God. That's the reality. That's the reality for my faith of how I see Jesus. And that's what I can share with you intentionally and in an authentic way. But you look at Nicodemus, who knew lots and lots of things and kept it all to himself. And then you look at this woman at the well who didn't know hardly anything at all. She knew that the well was from Jacob, and she knew that they worshipped here and the Jews didn't. She had a lot of questions. She didn't have a lot of answers. And yet she's the one that saved her whole town. That you don't have to have a theology degree in order to share your faith with somebody else. You don't have to know the Bible inside and out and upside down to be able to share what you experience God to be. And that's the piece that we kind of get that disconnect. Well, I can't tell anybody because what if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? Yeah, that's going to happen. And it's okay. You're not going to get struck by lightning. You just say, hey, I don't know. Let's go find out together. And even if they have a doubt or a fear that maybe is crippling them in their faith, if we can be authentic and honest and say, you know what, I struggle with that too. I have a hard time really wrapping my mind around this whole idea of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit. I, I, I see where you're coming from. And that's okay. We don't have to know all the answers. I just try to stay close to Jesus. So the questions that I have for us this morning is the first one I want you to think about. Who told you about Jesus? There was probably lots of people. And, and that piece about being the one who leads them to God, that's too much pressure. You know, there's usually a lot of people along the line that have to share Christ with somebody before they actually say yes. So if it's going to take eight people, just for example, that's not the magical number. It doesn't just take eight people. It might take 28. I don't know. But if it takes eight people and you're number six, you might walk away disappointed. Feeling like, but I shared my faith, Lord, and nothing happened. And he's like, oh, yes, it did. You were building those blocks of faith, and you're number six, and after number seven, we're going to catch up. But if we didn't have number six, we wouldn't have number eight. <coughs> that it's not your responsibility to get somebody to say yes to the Lord. It is your opportunity to share your experience of God. That that's all he asks us to do. We don't have to be responsible for saving anybody. Because we can't. Jesus is. He's the one who's responsible for saving us. All we have to do is say, here's what I know Jesus to be. We just need to make an introduction. She didn't go back and preach a sermon to them. She said, you've got to meet this guy. Come with me. And you can meet this guy. And that's how they came to faith. What does it look like in our daily lives to share our faith with somebody else? It might look very different for every person in this room. This is the tricky one. 
And at lunch today, I want you to talk to somebody about it. What stops us from sharing the good news with people that we're in relationship with? What is that obstacle that gets in the way? And the last one is who's someone God's asking me to mentor and share Jesus with today? You know, the thing that worked with the Samaritan woman was that she had this kind of contagious enthusiasm. And being contagious is terrible when you have a cold or the flu. Being contagious is great when you have enthusiasm or joy or happiness. And it's really great when you have the Lord. But it's not easy to maintain that joy and enthusiasm. And so that's why we come to church. So we can get filled up again and remember that first love. And then go out into the world that is hungry and hurting and desperate for this Jesus. On this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, there are hard things and hard conversations that we kind of put off until one time a year. And it's exhausting to keep after racial reconciliation, to be doing the hard work of connecting with people who don't look like us and maybe don't talk the same language as us and maybe have come from a place far, far away from our home. But when we have that joy and that enthusiasm, that gets contagious too. That when we say, I know it's hard, but I'm going to greet and be kind and engage and make a new friend with somebody who's vastly different than I am. Because that's where God calls me today. But be open every morning. Lord, who is it that you need me to share you with today? And then have your eyes open and your mouth ready. So that you can step into that with intentionality and be yourself. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you that you call us to follow you. Would you guide and direct our steps, our hearts, and our lives? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.